Hallelujah. We got ahead. Amen. Jesus is good. Go ahead and greet someone that's next to you. Say welcome to church today. Greet them. Make sure you're not a stranger. Want to say hello to all the online audience today. If you're watching from your home, you're about to have church. You're going to have the Holy Spirit invade your house. We thank you for tuning in. You're in connection with us. You're one of our family. We thank you so much. God bless every single one of you wherever you're at. I don't know if you guys knew, but we always online have more people online than we ever do in this building. So just give my hand real quick for people that are joining from all over. God bless you all. Yeah. Let's get into the Bible. Amen? It's a privilege to be able to minister to you guys. Did you guys come to hear the word? All right. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 35. Matthew chapter 18. I really love non-lazy Christians, meaning people who actually pull out their own Bibles and follow along. Don't, even if it's on the screen, please pull out your Bible, phone, whatever. Like, you might be able to mark in it. You might be able to take notes, you know. Be a person who always brings their Bible to church, amen? I don't care if it's digital. Hallelujah for that. All right. Who actually has a real Bible? Oh, my God. That's the real Christians. Holy cow. Whoa, right in front of me, man. Look at that. There's something different about carrying a real Bible. I've said this before, but, you know, when I go to airports or wherever it is that I'm going, if we need to, you can just give me a handheld, too. So praise God. When I go to airports or wherever it is I'm going, you sit down, you pull out your phone. They don't know what you're looking at. You pull out a Bible. They're scooting over seats. <laughs> Especially when you're on the plane and they have to sit next to you. I get my Bible and put it right there, open it up, and they're like. <laughs> Amen. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came to him and he asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Pause real quick. So Peter's coming in front of Jesus, hoping that he's impressed. He's like, I'm going to impress Jesus. I'm going to tell him I'm going to forgive seven times. He's going to be like, wow. But that's not what Jesus says. No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. That's 490 times in one day. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus continues, can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and children and everything he owed to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me. I promise I'm going to pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him. He released him and he forgave him all of his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. So he's just been forgiven millions. This man owes him a few thousand. And he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. He said, please be patient with me. I promise I'm going to pay this. But his creditor would not wait. He had the man arrested, put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. The king called in the man who had been forgiven and said, you evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. 490 times Jesus tells Peter, I want you to forgive. 490 times in 24 hours is three times per minute. Now some of y'all would be like, man, like, who would need to be forgiven 490 times? Well, 
There are some things that people do to you that you can forgive and be like, you know, it's all good, and you're done. But there are some pains, some hurts, some betrayals that you never saw coming. There are some people you trusted with everything, and they took your heart, chewed it, and spit it out and threw it away. There are some people that are closest to you that can hurt you in a way that nobody else can. So Jesus knows about those people, and he said, there are going to be some times that literally you're going to have to forgive, and you're going to need me, not just every day, you're going to need me every single minute. Let's try 30 minutes of forgiving the way that Jesus tells us to forgive. Every time you see their face, you have an opportunity to either feel bitterness, to feel hurt. I forgive them, Lord, and I let them go. Or you could say, I forgive them, Lord, and I let them go. There are some pains and some wounds I'm trying to tell because I know I'm talking to real people who have been through real pain. Some of y'all are going through something right now. And every time that person's face comes into your mind, you feel a deep hurt, a pain. You know that you're offended when somebody can say the name of a person. And if you hear that name, your day is completely turned upside down. Your attitude is completely shifted. I forgive them, Lord. But you have a chance to say, I forgive them, Lord. And I let them go. You see, God gives us the, the, the choice. He doesn't make us forgive. But you got to understand that your choice is determining how much God can bless you when it comes to forgiveness. I Why? Them, Lord, and I let them go. Because the only unforgivable sin is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is unforgivable to Jesus. Let's see what the Bible says. In Matthew, I forgive them, Lord, and I let chapter them go. 24, verse 10 through 13, Jesus is speaking about the end days, the last times. He said, at the end, in the end, many will be offended, and they will be repelled. They will begin to distrust and desert him who they ought to trust and obey. I who are they them, deserting? Lord, and I let them go. They're de deserting Jesus himself. And he's saying in the last days, many are going to be offended. And what happens? You actually are separating yourself when you get offended, not just from other people. You are separating yourself from the help of God. How do I know that? Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended is harder to be won over than a strong city. Their contentions separate them like bars of a castle. So you see, when you choose to stay offended... When you choose to say, it's my right, I'm going to go through my process. I have a right to feel the way I want to feel. I just want you to know, you are not just separating yourself from others. You are putting your walls up between you and God's help. You separate yourself from the hand of God being able to bless you, to help you. You enclose yourself around, and this is what also happens. You don't just separate yourself from God. You separate yourself from the love of those around your life that are trying to love you. Because you got to understand, they might not even have been the ones who hurt you. But when you're offended, you think unlogically. You, there's something that happens in your mind. There's something that happens in your heart. You, you literally have a supernatural ability to hear things that were never even said. When you're offended, you have a supernatural ability to hear things that were never even said. To believe that things happened that never even happened. You know it because you'll talk to your family and be, I can't believe they said that. And they'll be like, they never said that. What are you talking about? They never did that. What are you talking about? But you see, what's happening is the enemy has put a guise over your eyes. It's, it's like a veil. And all of the deceits and lies are now coming through unhindered. Not because it's God's fault, 
but because when you stay offended, you have separated yourself from the protection of God against the lies. You separate yourself from the protection of God against deceit. You separate yourself from knowing the truth. You can't discern anything anymore. The devil's just, he's, he's selling you lies and you're believing him. You, he said that. They did this. What are you talking about? None of that happened. But you believe it with all of your might. You know it happened. You're living in a false reality. And it's not just blocking off the blessing of God. People who truly love you, people who are trying to help you, you can't hear them. You can't receive their love. You can literally, when you're offended, have somebody who's telling you they love you standing in front of you. And all you're hearing is all of their rebuke and all of their disgust. And they're literally standing in front of you. You see, it's a serious thing to separate yourself from the hand of God. I know there's been pain. There's pain all over this building. I forgive them and I let them go. I know that it's real what somebody has done to you. I get it 100%. But you got to understand, forgiveness was never about them. It's never been about them having to apologize. Forget it if they ever apologize. That's not what's important. You need the blessing of God on your life. You need God's help with your children. You need God's help with your business. You need God's help with everything you're doing. You need God. You cannot stay separated. Don't put yourself away from the love that's trying to come to you. You cannot afford to go through this life without the hand of God blessing you. But I'm telling you, the only unforgivable sin, Jesus will not break through that bar for you. He will not break through that stronghold for you. He says you have to tear the walls down. You have to choose to forgive. You have to choose to let it down. I'm not going to tear this wall down. I'm not going to break this one down. I'm going to leave you where you are until you realize how much you've been forgiven so that you can now forgive. Watch what happens. Matthew 24 says this. It says many are going to be offended, repelled away from God and people. But watch this. They're going to stumble and fall away. Many will stumble and fall away. So you got to imagine there's going to be people at the judgment seat who went to church for years who are a part of church drama teams and events, who volunteered to go out to adopt the block. But they chose at one point not to forgive someone in their life. And God will have to tell them, all the things you've done do not count. You didn't make it. Because unforgiveness is unforgivable. There will be people, there will be preachers, y'all, who are standing there and gave their life, but they were preaching with bitterness in their heart their entire life. There are people who will be serving in children's ministries, but they are still not forgiving. So you try to plague it up. What do you do? You try to go to more things. You try to fast longer. But the fasting isn't working because you're still bitter. The sermons aren't touching you because you're still bitter. More church is not the answer. More things aren't the answer. It can't penetrate you. You go to a worship service and they're singing songs and the person to your left is weeping and crying. And the person to your right is getting touched. But you're feeling nothing. Why? Not because God doesn't love you. It's not his choice. You have separated yourself because you will not let it go. I forgive them and let them go. I forgive them. I let them go. I forgive them. I let them go. I forgive them. I let them go. Listen to what the Bible continues to say. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive and lead many into error. Why is it saying this right after that? Because the people who are going to be deceived are the offended. If you are not a person who gives into offense, you will not fall for the enemy. You will have a clear mind. You'll be able to know that's not God. I'm not going to be led away, but many false prophets and teachers are arising up, and they're speaking a different gospel. But if you are a person who's susceptible to offense, you will fall for it. You see, you don't just put yourself in danger of disconnection from God. You put yourself in danger of even knowing what is the truth. I forgive them and let them go. And the love of the great body of people will grow cold. Because of the multitude of lawlessness and iniquity. But listen to what Jesus says. Those who endure till the end will be saved. 
It is not those who came and said a prayer at an altar and then were unforgiving for the rest of their life that will be saved. No, 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 no. Those who endure. You know why he says endure? Because he knows we're all going to go through real pain. He knows we're all going to face hurt. If you have to live life, guess what? You're going to be hurt. You cannot go through life without somebody being imperfect. Do you know why? Because we're all imperfect and we all need a savior. People are going to be people. They're going to have issues. They're going to have problems. But can I ask you this question? Did you need God's help? They also need God's help. The point is that if you're expecting perfection, you are setting yourself up. Our expectations put us in a place where we begin to falter because we have false expectations on people that God did not tell us to have. There is nobody perfect but God. That's what the Bible says. Nobody. There is nobody fully dependable but God. That's what the Bible says. Nobody. I know you want it to be your spouse. I know that you're hoping that it's your children, but please understand, there's still people who need God just like you. Can I say it like this? Your husband is not the person who's supposed to bring you happiness. Your wife's job is not to make you happy. I don't know who sold you the false romantic idea, but marriage was about making you more like Jesus. Marriage was about taking things in you, putting them out, purifying them, pulling them to the surface. It's not about you trying to be happy. Only Jesus can fulfill your soul. You see, you have your husband or wife on the pedestal so God can't jump in because they're on the throne. You're looking to your husband to make you feel valuable. That's not his job. You're looking to your wife to make you feel valuable. That's not her job. We are putting false expectations on each other, and that's why we are constantly being failed by other people because nobody is like Jesus. I forgive them, Lord, and I let them go. He who endures to the end, he who goes through this life with pains, and yes, I could even say betrayals for some of you. What's betrayal? What's the difference between pain? Pain is just anybody could hurt you. Betrayal is when someone close to you. When someone you never expected. That's a different kind of pain. But Jesus says, I'll be with you if you will choose to say, I forgive them, Lord. I let them go. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Watch this. In as much as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings, every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, we lead every thought and purpose away, captive into the obedience of Christ. Who's leading? Are your thoughts leading your life or are you leading your thoughts? Are your emotions running your world or are you leading your emotions? You see, David woke up in Psalm 42 and he woke up and he was depressed. And he's like, this isn't okay. I don't know why I'm depressed. I don't have to be depressed. So he looked at himself and he began to preach to himself. You see, you got to understand something. You're not always going to have a prophet who's going to point you out in the service and be like, God sent me here to give you a word. Well, what if you don't? Are you just going to be destitute because he didn't call you out? You're not going to have Pastor Marco wake up at 3 a.m. and be like, God was telling me there's something on my heart. I had to call you tonight. You're not going to have that happen. You're not going to be able to have a pastor with you walking 24-7, getting in the car with you, going to Walmart. But you know who you have with you all the time? Yourself. The greatest preacher in your life is yourself. You got to know how to preach to yourself. You see, the Bible says that David came home one day and all of the women were taken. He had just won a battle. All the women were taken. All the kids were gone. And it said even his soldiers were thinking about stoning him. But he didn't wait around. He didn't say, who's going to preach to me? Who's going to encourage me? It said he went and encouraged himself in the Lord. He got by himself and said, God, you're still with me. God, you're strong. God, I can do it. Even if they all be against me, I didn't depend on them anyway because my dependence is upon you. I forgive them and I let them go. The world's greatest preacher is yourself. You look at yourself in the mirror every day. You are walking around with yourself every day. You see, God did a powerful thing. He disconnected your mouth from your soul. What do I mean? Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Now, those emotions can be strong. Those thoughts can be strong. Your wants can be strong. 
But God did something. He created the heavens and the earth with the sound of his mouth. The Bible said he spoke and light was. He spoke and the birds came. He spoke and the animals were there. He spoke and the earth was formed. He spoke, he went like this and formed a man out of the dust of the earth. And then he goes and breathes into it. And the death was now life, a living being all from his mouth. And this is what God said. He said, now I give you my mouth. That mouth has the power to shift things. You see, the earth was formless and void, Genesis 1, 2. But when Jesus spoke, the formlessness, the, the voidness, the absurdity began to scatter. Because when God speaks, creative power is released. Something that wasn't there is now created. You see, God gives you his mouth. Why? Because you can speak to a chaotic emotion and say, I know that you're not there yet, but this is what God says. I know that you're not there. He gave you his mouth. You got to preach to yourself. I forgive them and I let them go. You got to say, I forgive them. I let them go. You see, he says that all of these things, you got to lead your thoughts. You got to lead your emotions. And you got to take them captive. What does that mean? It means you got to put them under arrest. You got to chain them up. No, that's not God. I know that you think that you're worth nothing. I chain up that thought. I take it captive. Get behind me. Oh, you, you're, you're not going to be a good mom. You're all by yourself. You're failing as a mother. I take that thought. I chain it and put it behind me. Are you just going to let your thoughts run your life? Or are you going to lead your thoughts? Acts 24, 16. Therefore, I will always exercise discipline. I mortify my body. I mortify the carnal affections, the bodily appetites, the worldly desires. Because I'm constantly endeavoring. The word endeavor means I'm striving. I'm pushing to have a clear conscience. Void of offense toward I God and, and go. toward people. Do you know you can be offended at God? We know we can be offended at people, but some of you... You're offended at God. He said that you're going to have to push for this. And I let them go. You're going to have to push for this. You're going to have to actually strive for this. You're going to have to on a continually basis, sometimes daily, depending on how deep the pain is. You're going to have to actually strive and push to release people over and over and over and over. And you're going to have to make peace with God. I forgive them and I let them go. God did not take your child away. God did not make you sick. God is not the one at fault for all the terrible things that are happening. That's not. Jesus came to bring life, not death. Jesus came to give you life and that more abundantly, not death. Well, then what happened? I can't understand it. Well, welcome to being a Christian. You can't understand everything that God does. If we could, we could be God. But we're not God. He's God. I don't know why that happened. I don't know what's going on. But I know someone who's here in the building right now today. He's waiting for you to release this so that he can bless you. I know someone who's here who can go home with you if you don't already know him. Who could be in your life walking step by step. I know someone who's reaching out to you who wants to invade your dreams. Who wants to take away your anxiety. Who I've seen him heal millions and millions of people's hearts. Luke 17, 1, look at this. Jesus says, it is impossible that offenses will not come. But woe to him when they come through. Look at the Amplified. Jesus says, temptations, snares, traps to entice you. That's what offenses are. They're sure to come. In other words, if you're going to live this life, you will have an opportunity to truly be offended. But watch what he says. They are traps. These are not just offenses. It's a trap of the enemy. You go. see, I have these traps that are up here on stage. These, all these rat traps. And you see, we cannot see our own future. But God is already in the future. Do you agree? God is not bound by time. He's already there. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10... That there's no temptation that has come to man. That God has not already made a way of escape. Why is that? Because he's already in the future and he loves you so much that he goes before you. And he sees there's going to be opportunity to get offended here. Somebody might betray you here. Somebody's maybe going to hurt you here. This is going to be here, here. And he goes ahead of you. 
And he puts an exit door and he attaches it to every possible outcome. He gives you a way of escape before you even get there. Did you hear what I just said? He already has attached a way of escape before you're ever tempted. So he goes and you're walking through life and you have to literally, you have a chance to be offended. Your mother-in-law just came over. Oh God. So there's a trap and you're about to step in it. But when you say, I forgive them, Lord, and I let them go, you forgo the trap. You walk the next day and then your boss, man, you know, your boss, dear God, you know, he just never understands. He's a pompous, you know, total just jerk, right? So you're there and it's like, man, he don't care about nobody. So you're about to step in a trap, but you got to remember everybody's imperfect. He's just being imperfect like he's supposed to be. Think about it like that. He's just being imperfect like he's supposed to be. You can't expect something of a person, especially if he's not even saved. So you have bosses that aren't even saved, and you're expecting them to act like Christians. Come on now. The world needs to just act like the world. Don't be surprised when the world acts like the world. So you're sitting here right now, and but no, I forgive them, Lord, and I let them go. You missed that one. But there are these traps. There are these places that you can literally be eaten by the enemy. But this isn't even what it is. This isn't what it means. I forgive them, Lord. This is patty cake stuff. The Bible says that when you choose not to forgive... You put your entire self in a prison. It's not this little trap here. It's not this little trap here. You imprison yourself. And the Bible says the torturers, the torturers are free to come and torture you. What is that? That's depression is freed on your life. That's thoughts of suicide are freed on your life. That's thoughts of hopelessness. That's anxiety where you can't sleep at night because you keep having anxious attacks. That's these things. They're put in your life because you have put yourself completely in a prison. Because you choose to stay offended and you can't say, I forgive them, Lord. I let them go. It's a trap. I forgive them and I let them go. It's the bait of the enemy. Jesus says that many will show up to heaven and not make it because of this trap called offense. This is so amazing. Psalm 119, verse 165. Listen to what Jesus says about people who let it go go. and depend on Jesus. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing shall offend them. Or make them stumble. Do you know? You know how many times I walk and talk to people and they say, Man, my dad just really knows how to push my buttons, man. He just knows where it hurts me. And my sister, she just knows where it hurts me. And do you know there's a place you can get to in Jesus where all the buttons will be removed and there'll be nothing to push? Well, I'm human. I'm human. I can only feel what I feel. I understand. But I'm not talking about human love. I'm not talking about something that comes from practicing human strength. I'm not talking about anything that even comes from you. I'm talking about something divine. I'm talking about something so powerful it's above you. I'm talking about the love of God flowing through your life. It's not understandable. It doesn't make sense. The Bible says there's a peace that passes all understanding. Why do you think it says that? Because you're not going to understand it. You're not going to understand why you're in joy when everybody else is weeping. You're not going to understand how you're able to let go of something that everybody else is in so much pain for. You're not going to be able to understand how you're still living and strong and have purpose and have dreams when everybody says your dreams already should have died because they discounted you. It's not going to be understandable. It's the love of God. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 20. We have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. I forgive them and I let them go. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. But that's too low. How differently we know him now. We are Christ's ambassadors. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who is sent from a kingdom. And he's sent and wherever he goes the kingdom supports him. The kingdom pays for all of his food. The kingdom pays for all of the suits and the clothes that he'll wear or that she will wear, the dresses that she'll have. 
The kingdom that she sent from will pay for everything. All the cars are going to pick her up at the airport and the plane ride that's there. But there's only one condition. You can never represent your own opinion. You're there to represent the opinion of the kingdom you came from. Paul just said, we, if you are born again, are an ambassador of God. Why is that important? Because I've heard so many people say, well, I have a right to be offended. I'll go through my own process. I just got to tell you, as a believer, you do not have a right to be offended. Matter of fact, all your rights went out the door. How do I know this? Well, Jesus says that I own your time. Matthew says, Jesus is preaching and says, it's wrong and evil for you to say, I'm going to go here tomorrow and then go there and two years from now I'll be there and there. He said, what you should say is if God says it's okay, we'll be there and there and there because you don't own your time anymore. Well, Haggai says you don't own your money anymore. The Bible says all the silver and gold is God's. The Bible said the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And every person in it, you don't even, believe, you don't even own your daughter and son. I forgive them and you think that they're your kids? Really? God passed them through you to steward, but they're his kids. That's why you can't just yell at them whatever way you want to. That's why you can't just say whatever you want to. It's not your property. Oh, you think your wife belongs to you because she has a wing on her finger? I forgive them. And that I ring is for every other man on earth to know that she's taken, but it's not for God. She belongs to God before she belongs to you. She's a daughter before she's your wife. He's a son before he's your husband. You see, ownership is a myth. Stewardship is what we have as Christians. I forgive them and I let them Stewardship go. is we are given something to steward for our time here on earth, which is very brief. If you could think about you living your life, think about 80 years of your life. Say you live to 80 years or 85. I believe many of you will even live even longer than that. But say you live that long. If you could imagine that I have literally, let me take this stick. If I had this stick, and you can imagine 80 years of your life. It seems like a long time, maybe. But then think about what eternity is. Eternity is not a number that is quantifiable. There is no number that can measure eternity. It is zero. Anything times zero equals zero. So what he is saying is what we do in this life, this small portion, if we're offended or if we choose to forgive, is going to determine how long we are going to live eternity. Now imagine the stick stretches all the way past the stage. Now imagine the stick stretches all the way around the entire building. Now imagine the stick goes down Hallmark Parkway. Imagine it goes under the overpass. Imagine it crosses all the way over California. Now imagine the stick goes all the way from West Coast to East Coast. Now imagine the stick goes through the water and goes all the way around the world and it never stops. That's still not even an nth of what eternity is. And we are so upset and we are so consumed with this little bit that's why I can't understand when people are like, man, well, you got to do it now. You're not going to have any time. I'm sitting there. I don't understand you. What do you mean you're living for now? Well, if you don't do it now, man, you got to get it all while you're here. Do it all. No, 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 no. I'm seeking storage in heaven. I'm seeking treasures in heaven. I'm seeking what I'm going to have for eternity. And I don't have time to be offended at you for this little time. You ain't got time for this, guys. And I let them go. You see, why would God expect you and I to just get over the things that are hurting us? How could God ask that? Gavin, you don't know what's happened to me. You're right. I don't. You don't know what they've done to me. Can I tell you this? I know what you did to I Jesus. Them, Lord, and I let them go. I know what I did to Jesus. You see, if you think that you're separated somehow because back there 2,000 years ago, those people whipped him. No, 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 no. Your sin was doing that too. Those people spat on him. Uh-uh. You were there. Those people were the ones beating him. No, you were there. Those people were the ones mocking him and taking his clothes. No, you were there. You were a part. It was your sin that put him there. Every one of us in this building is guilty. Our sin was the ones that put him on the cross. Forgive them, Lord, and I let them go. How can you ask this of me, Gavin? It was so painful. Well, let me tell you about pain. Pain is a magnificently powerful thing. 
There's only two ways that you can use pain. You can either allow pain to I use you. Them, Lord, and I let them go. You'll become bitter. You'll become dangerous. You'll become unsafe. Or you can put your pain in the hands of God. What happens is God takes your pain and he makes you a minister. He makes you a powerful man and woman of God. He puts you in places and promotes you more than you ever know. How do I know this? Because the book of James says this. James says that when persecution and trials come, count it all for joy. Why? Because it's the testing of your faith that will produce for you to go to another level. See, if everybody was kind to you, you could not be more like Jesus. If everybody loved you, you wouldn't have an opportunity to become more like Jesus. But it's the times when you don't want to forgive, you get to be more like Jesus. It's the times that people offend you that you get to say, I forgive you and I let you go. You see, it's the time that you're tempted that you say, Lord, I choose you over what my flesh wants to do. You now get to be more like Jesus because there's a sacrifice that's lit from your life. The fire goes up and the incense of the place you're standing goes up to the nostrils of God. Why can God ask this of you? Because of one thing in one moment. When Jesus was on that cross, the crown of thorns was in his head. We put it there. I forgive him and I let them go. The stripes were on his back. We put him there. The nails were in his feet. You put him there. The nails were in his hands. The Bible says that Jesus' heart exploded in his chest so that blood and water flowed out. His literal physical heart exploded so that you and I's heart could be mended. And it's said that when blood and water flowed out, they pierced his side and it came out of his side. Why did they have to put a hole in his side? So that the church could now go in and be found in Christ. You see, Jesus was in his last moments, and with the little breath he had left, he didn't say, Lord, get them back. He didn't say, Lord, I know they're guilty. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I know they did it to you. I know it's painful. I can't even imagine. I don't know what you've been through, but I know what we put Jesus through. I'm still understanding it. And every year of my life, I get more of a revelation of what we put Jesus through. But he says, forgive them. The moment he said that, we now have no excuse not to forgive. Every eye closed in this place right now. Every eye closed. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. As your eyes are closed, I want to tell you a story real quick. There's a pastor friend of mine. He lives in Illinois. Uh, my dad was telling me a story about him, and I said, I got to talk to him myself. So I was over there preaching, and he was driving me back to the airport. And I said, Pastor, is this true? So his story is this. He was in his 20s. Just focus on the Lord right now. Listen to what I'm saying. He was in his 20s, and he was drunk, and he was high on drugs, and he ran a red light, and he hit a car and killed an 18-year-old girl. So he's sentenced to prison. They were giving, giving him, like, it was like almost a life sentence, but a lot of it was taken away. So anyway, about five to six months into his time in prison, this couple, it's an older couple, is beginning to visit him. And like he was just happy to have visitors, so he's like, man, I don't care. Whoever can just visit me, I just want to talk to somebody. But about the third or fourth time that they came, he finally asked them who they were. And this couple says, we're the parents of the girl that you killed. He said, what? He said, she was our only daughter. She was all that we had in this life. 
and now she's gone. But we're Christians. And we know that Jesus forgave us. We want you to know that we forgive you, but we also have an invitation for you. We'd like to know, because now we don't have a child, if we could adopt you as our son. This is not human. That moment he got saved, he's a pastor now in Illinois of an incredible church, multiple churches. I want to tell you something. You cannot do something like that in your own human strength. Can I just make that clear? It is impossible for you to ever feel you could ever do anything like that. Do you know there are so many things that we cannot do that God requires of us? You know it's impossible for you to actually live as a Christian that God requires? You need God's help. Without the supernatural power of God's love, we could not do it. I'm telling you right now, this is a moment that's about to set you free. Because the moment you tear down your walls today, the power of God is going to come into your life. And He's going to help you do things you could have never done on your own. There are things that you'll say that you know, how did I say that? Because God was with you. There are people that you're going to lead to Jesus and say, how did that ever happen? How was I, a person like me? You know how? Because if God's going to help you, but you got to let him help you. Every eye is closed right now. I'm going to ask a question. If there is a person that I could name their name and you would automatically cringe inside or feel pain, or there is somebody who you know that you are still bitter towards, every person quiet right now. I want you, it's not about me or any person, you're not going to walk up to the front. But I want you just to make an acknowledgement because when you do this, you have your own key in your hand. God is not holding you in that cell. You're going to let yourself out right now. I want you to say, I'm going to let them go and forgive them. I want you just to stand to your feet quietly right where you're at. Right now, all over this building, do it. Do not hesitate. Stand to your feet. Nobody's clapping. Nobody's clapping. This is not an exciting, jumping up and down kind of a moment. Turn the music up just a little bit. Every eye is closed. This is what I want you to do. I want you, as I'm going to say this prayer, to repeat the best you can. You don't have to shout it. You could just whisper it to the Lord. But there's going to be a moment I'm going to walk you through. And then the power of God is going to touch you. So I want you to totally focus and surrender yourself to God right now. I want you to say these words out loud. You can just whisper it. Dear Lord Jesus, help me. Help me. Say it again. Help me. Why is that important? Because the Bible says I cried out to the Lord, and he heard me, and he came and delivered me. I want you to say it again. Help me, God, to forgive. I let them go. Say it. Say it again. I let them go. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to see their face in your mind. It might be multiple people. I want you to see their face in your mind. I want you to now, in your mind's eye, take those people's faces in your hands. And I want you now to offer those faces to Jesus because he's right in front of you. Do it right now. Jesus, just touch people right now. He's touching people all over this building. Just let it go. Let it go. He's touching you right there. He's touching you right here. Just let him touch you. Just release it. Release it right now. There's no hurry right now. This is between you and God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There's a divine touch of God right now. Let it go. Come on, just let it go to God. Release them, Lord. Release them, Lord. Release them. Tear down those walls right now. 
It's not about them. Set yourself free. Some of these people are dead already and you're still a slave. Set yourself free. Be released in Jesus' name. Black God, touch you right there. Focus. There it is. Just be released in Jesus' name. Be released in Jesus' name. Focus between you and God. Nobody's looking at you. This is between you and God. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what anybody around you thinks. This is personal between you and God. Tear the walls down so that the hand of God can come upon you. Touching your heart and your family. Healing your body. Healing the children that you need him to touch. Come on. You have the key. Let yourself out right now. I forgive them and let them go. I forgive them and let them go. It doesn't matter if they ever apologize. I forgive them and let them go. Jesus, right now, all over this place. I sense the power of God moving. The Holy Spirit is so precious right now. Let the love of God invade. He's right there. Jesus is right here. Jesus is right here. Nothing matters anymore. Going on with this service does not matter at this point. Jesus is right here. We're talking about a real personal God. We're talking about a Jesus who said, I forgive you. Can you forgive yourself right now? Let yourself go. Let yourself go. God is not coming with condemnation. He's not coming with guilt. The cross has already paid for your sin. Let yourself go. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Receive today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As you are still in God's presence, I just feel so much pain in this building. I just feel so much pain in this building. I'm so sorry. We as your pastors love you, you know. We wish we could hear every single story and be able to comfort you in every way that we could. But I'm telling you, this is better. If you'll just give it to Jesus, he can move a lot quicker. He can help you a lot more. You don't have to book a counseling session for this to happen right now. He's right here. The cross is right there. He'll use that cross and he'll help you even with this task that seems impossible. Because I know that we could never understand, but just know God understands. I promise He loves you. I promise He's for you, not against you. I promise He wants to help you. Every person who's watching, I feel that there's so much right now. Focus yourself on Jesus. Right through that screen, God is touching people all over. Let Him invade your house. If you're at home, get on your knees right now if you feel God is touching you. If you're standing right now and God's touching you, I want you to get on your knees. Get on your knees right now. There's a special move that's about to happen. I feel something coming. I don't know how to say this better. I'm not trying to be weird, I promise. I just know there's a fresh wind that's about to touch some people right now. There's something about to happen. And I just anticipate it and it's right there. I just want us to get ready. Get in a surrendered position right now. Now, I want you to just look at Jesus. And I want you to just say this under your breath. Every person, even if you're not praying right now for forgiveness, just ask this because I believe God's going to give you something. Say, God, give me whatever it is you have for me right now. Put your hands out. Say it. God, forgive me everything you want me to have right now. 
Now just go in. Just go and worship God right now. Just worship Him. Just thank Him and worship Him. He's touching. I feel like He's touching kids that are not in this building. He's touching some of your children. He's reaching out past your prayers right now. If you could see in the Spirit, your prayers are being used right now. And they're going and they're reaching out to your children outside of this building. Come on, just thank Him and worship Him right now. Thank you, Lord God. I see sisters coming back together. There's restoration. I see at least 11, 12, 13, 14. There's about, there's a 15, 15 even more. Even more relates. These sisters, restoration's happening. God's doing it right now as you thank Him. Supernaturally, God is bringing those family members back into a place of reunion. I see there's a son in particular. There's a son who is not in this country. He's been separated from you. He's in a different country. You've been praying for him. You have not been able to see him in I don't know how long. God sees you. He knows where you are. Just thank him and praise him. He's making a way right now. He's grafting a way. My God. Thank you, Lord God. I see there's a huge host of angels on the left side of the building, just over here. Once again, I promise I'm not trying to be weird. I'm just telling you what I'm seeing. Just a host of angels just over here. I see just on this side that he's, he's, it's like there's a blue mist that's being released from heaven. All that is right now is it says, I'm giving you the power to obey. I'm giving you the power right now that this is reunited relationships. Reunited relationships. I'm giving you the power to forgive so that I can do what I... He said, if you'll release them from your hands, I'll release what's in my hand. That's what he just said. Release them from your hands, I'll release what's in mine. Thank you, God. I see that there's shackles right here on the back side of the building. There's this uh, handcuffed shackles that are up in the air right now. And I see that the shackles are being broken. It's because some of you right now, uh, dr the serious drug addictions, alcoholics in your family, you've been praying for a long time. Not only are they coming to the Lord, but I see them because they're the ones who are breaking the shackles. That's it. It's not them that they're going to get the breakthrough. That's the first step. They're going to be here giving breakthrough to others. I see it happening in anointing right over here for people in your family that are not even saved. They will be in this church, I'm telling you, within the next 12 months, some of y'all, and they're going to be breaking shackles on other people's life. This through holy warriors, all kinds of stuff that's going to happen. There's a mother and a daughter right now. You're sitting in this building. You have not talked to each other the entire drive here. Maybe you came in different uh, cars. I don't know. But you're in this building and there's such a wall between you. God is saying, let that wall down because your relationship, your relationship, there are children that the daughter, your daughter, you have not allowed the children to be able to see your mother. God is breaking down that wall right now. Just receive it right now. Let him do it. Your mother is going to be a blessing. She's changed. I know that there was a past with her before, but God's worked on her. You have to forgive and allow this to happen because your mother has blessings. She wants to give your kids. Man, I'm serious. This is super specific. This is crazy what's happening right now. Yeah, there's a few people with arthritis, just over here, arthritis. It's because of unforgiveness. Forgive right now. He's releasing you. I feel like literally releasing you. Start opening up and closing your hands. There's arthritis in some of your forearms and hands and a couple of you in your knees. Just start opening and releasing and move those knees. God's touching you right now. Guys, I didn't plan for any of this, but this is the power of what will happen if Jesus gets to come in. Thank you, Lord. Uh, right here in the red shirt, you can just get attention. What's your name? Luis? <clears throat> okay, so God is fast-tracking your progress through the decision you're making right now seven times faster than it was going to be. God needs you to be in a place where you can minister and release a lot quicker. So he's taking you from a bunch of things right now. So what's going on is you're about to go through a seriously quick process of being totally recovered in every way. But God says, you got to surrender to me. Now that you've let these people go, God says, I'm now able to finally access you. I, I'm seeing that God's been chasing you since you were a little kid. Like really, really trying to access you. There's been people in your life never stop praying for you. There's all kinds of things like all around, okay? You've chosen some things. There's been a lot of pain, a lot of things done to you as well. But God's saying, since then I wanted to start you. But now he says, I see you as that little child still. 
you're coming to me, and I'm going to begin because no time has been wasted. That's what he just told me. No time has been wasted or lost. I am the God that restores the years that the locusts and the canker worm have taken away. He's going to restore all those years. Receive that. Wow. If, man, I have to continue, but if you say, Lord God, I do not know Jesus. I need Jesus right now. Altar team, please come up. Everybody stay in this atmosphere. You never know what's going to happen. Just say, Lord God, I want Jesus and I have peace with God. I want forgiveness. I could never forgive myself. If that's you, I don't want you to hesitate. Just get up and walk up here to the front right now. Get up right now. Come on, I want Jesus. I need to get saved. I don't have peace with God. Come up to the front right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look, they're coming from there. They're coming from here. Come on. Come on. Give them a hand as they're coming. Give them a hand as they're coming right now. Give them a hand. Come on. Look at these people coming right now. Look at these people coming right now. I need Jesus. I want Jesus. I need Jesus. I want peace with God. I want to be forgiven. He made a way. He already made a way. Come on. Give them a hand. They're still coming from the back. If you right now are online and you say, I want to be saved, make sure that you write in in the comments, I want to be saved, and we'll be able to contact through igotsaved.com, igotsaved.com. Please plug in so we can help you. Every person that's on here right now, Pastor Christian's going to come. It's going to lead you in this prayer. Thank you all for your time. Don't leave before this prayer is said. This is a sacred moment, and we want to celebrate with our brothers and sisters. God bless you. Received freedom this morning. You receive freedom. Come on, one shout of praise for all that God has done. We're just going to dismiss in one second. I just want to pray. And those that are up here today, we want to connect you to your next step. Your next step is a class. It's called Starting at the Way. And in this class, what we're going to do, we're going to help you to grow in your walk with God, to get baptized, and just start your growth journey. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you. They're gonna, and then altar workers, we're going to open our apps and we're going to click the I Got Saved banner and help them get signed up for their next step. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. And I want everyone to repeat, it, repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross and raise from the dead so that I can be saved. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy and for your love. I put my faith in you, Jesus. I repent of my sin, and I turn to you. Thank you for giving your life to me. Now I give my life to you. Forgive me, and give me strength to forgive others when they hurt me. Give me the power to show them mercy and to love them the way you've loved me. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise today. We love you, church. This Wednesday night at 7 p.m., we're going to hear on another, another amazing testimony from a family that's been transformed. Powerful. You don't want to miss this Wednesday at 7 p.m. We love you, church. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. And remember, if God is for you, there is nobody who can come against you. God bless you. If you need prayer, we have a team up here. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Take care.